Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to Witten on another beautiful summer's morning. The rain is coming, they say. <clears throat> but it's welcome into God's house this morning, and I uh, just pray that the service will be a blessing to each and every one of us this morning. If you're visiting us or new, a very warm welcome to you this morning. It's lovely to have you with us. We are broadcasting live today, so good morning to everyone who's watching online. You're very welcome to join us, and uh, if you're watching on Catch Up later, again, may the service be a blessing to you as you catch up. I don't know about some of you, sometimes we watch it again during the week, and it's nice to hear the message again, and you, you hear things that perhaps you didn't hear the first time, so it's great to have that facility available. And thank you, David, again this morning for all the work you've been doing. You will have got your notice sheet as you came in, just to highlight a few things. Prayer meeting on Tuesday. But I mustn't forget this evening, I'm jumping ahead of myself. This evening there is a service at half past six, Time with God. And that does include communion, doesn't it, Carl? Yes, certainly, and the time of prayer and reflection. On Tuesday, the prayer meeting at half past seven. On Wednesday, the community cafe and a, a maintenance team meeting in the evening. On Thursday, prayer time at two o'clock and also the life group at Sarah's house, 256 Dales Road. Next Sunday, we have the privilege of uh, Malcolm McGregor joining us to bring us God's word. Please see the, the list of people for prayer and other items on your prayer list. We have good news this morning. Val is coming home tomorrow. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Val, if you're watching. You know how much you want to come home and how much your beloved cats are missing you. So Angela spoke to Val this morning and she's coming home tomorrow. So that's really great news and we pray for her continued recovery. Of course our thoughts go out to the families in Nottingham this week. The devastation that's been caused there. So uh, yes, and the continuing war in Ukraine. But I'll hand over to our pastor now for this morning's worship. And... Uh, Cole, it's over to you. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you're not getting too put up with this hot weather we've been having recently and you're not praying for rain. <laughs> Our sermon is about praying for rain, um, but it was a lot hotter in Israel, especially uh, two and a half, three thousand years ago. But we're going to begin by singing together, by focusing in on the reason we're here. We're going to stand and sing together, Name of All Majesty, that lovely hymn by Timothy Dudley Smith.
your seats, but keep that theme in your mind. Jesus <coughs> is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Let's bow our heads and speak to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, Sunday, a day that you gave us for a day of rest, a day of reflection, a day that's different. It's holy, it's apart, it's, it's not the same as other days of the week. It's meant to be for us as that these doors are open and allowing the breeze to come through this room. Sunday is meant to be the day to receive the breeze of God, to rest in his coolness. After the busyness and the heat and the work, all the energies of the week, Sunday's a day to sit back and kick out and say thank you, Father. Father, we just come into this place to do just that. And Father, it can be difficult because we often bring the chaos of our lives into this place. We can be on busy roads a few minutes beforehand, that busy business, be on phone calls and other things that distract and mean that when we come through these doors, we're uptight, the coils spring. Lord, it's difficult sometimes to just let go and relax. But Father, we ask you by your Spirit, come upon this place now. Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, bring us peace. Bring us a sense, Father God, of your presence. Lord, we can hear the birds calling in the, in the background. Such the, the music you've provided us is the background music to life. It's calming, it's refreshing, it's beautiful. Lord, may we hear you speak into our lives. May we sense that wind of your Spirit. Chasing away the shadows, the smokes, the, the smells that linger, the things that cause us to be worried and upset. May they bring that coolness of your presence, that sense of seeing things as they really are, of hearing you speak, of being calm in your presence. May this day be for each one of us a day of rest as we seek to spend it with you, and with those you've given us and those we love. Father, bless this day. Be with us, Father, each one. But be with those, Father, who are watching later on online or watching even now, right now. Be with them. May they too sense your spirit. And we pray especially for those who can't be with us. We pray for that. We pray you may be with her, that she may sense your spirit. For Nigel and Janet, they may sense your spirit. And that, Lord, you may calm us just help us, Lord, as we lay back to look up, to see you in your majesty, and to realize Jesus is Lord. Lord Jesus, make it so in your name. Amen. Are there many boys and girls here this morning? There must be a few boys and girls. Don't come down the front, boys. I need, need your help. That's it. Any more boys and girls? That's just... Just for two of them, right? Oh, no, three. Good. Okay, we've got a mixture. We we'll want come sit over here. Be easier. Then you can see what I'm really doing. Because today is a special day, isn't it? Because today is a day about a day about what? Dad, so what's today? Father. Right, okay. Put your hands up if you've got if you have a have a father or you had a father. You see all your hands up, people. You don't come here by osmosis. You do have fathers. Okay. Put your hand down. Those of you who have a father who's alive, have you thanked them today? Um <laughs> That's why I got, Richard, an um. Um. Sorry? Maybe. You're not exactly certain, okay? So this may be on your to-do list, at the top of your to-do list on Father's Day. Because the fact is, fathers are a blessing from God. And they come in all different kind of, of I'm doing my, my pens, uh, shapes and sizes. All different si kind of fathers we have. We have fathers who are Big fathers, okay, 
and we have little fathers. And we have different shaped fathers. shaped fathers. Dads come in all shapes and all sizes. Okay, you can see that just looking at two dads here, Trevor and myself. We're fathers and we're brothers and we're different shapes and sizes. Because rather like these wonderful sweets, God gives us all sorts of dads in order to make us a blessing. But the important thing on days like this is to remember to give thanks. Because it's very easy to imagine, okay, that things just happen by chance. I had this when I first got married with my wife, Fiona. There was a table in our living room, okay. I thought it was a magic table. Because whatever mess I left there, when I came back the following morning, it was always cleared up. <laughs> it was quite incredible. It was a magic table. But after a few years, I discovered it wasn't really magic cleaning it up, it was Fiona. And things happen in our world not simply by chance, it's by design. And God's given us that, it's to be a blessing to us and to help us. And so make sure you thank your fathers today. It's really, really important you do that. And because they come in all shapes and all sizes, I thought it was really quite appropriate that we go around the church, children, and give the dads an all sorts. I've only got two dispensers, so perhaps the boys take one and Abby take the other. There we go. You go ahead and give all the men in the building a all sort of thank you. <laughs> you have a specially chosen for you. <laughs> this is communion of a different type. It's not a communion found in the New Testament, but it's... Make sure you don't miss anyone. Anyone not... Over here, anyone not have one here? Did you get one? Sorry, Peter. Right. Peter? You've missed Peter. Okay. Sorry? Oh, yes, and there's... Uh, I think... That's great. So everyone had one here. That's good. Right, that's good. Do you, do you want to go upstairs as well? Give one to Robin and David up in the up in the loft. Does everyone have one? Is that for me? You get a very kind go and learn this. Everyone have one here? Yeah, that's good. Over here? See Vernon, that's good. Kevin hasn't had one though. That's right, Dale hasn't had one, Derek. Peter here, yeah, that's it. That's good. And Roger. Judith's been subversive over here. <laughs> I suppose in nowadays, nowadays, as you can choose your gender, you can, you can do that kind of thing. <laughs> okay, ev ev everyone had some. Everyone had one. Jolly good. Thank you, boys. Well, you can have one too for your hard work. Okay. There we go. Let's bow our heads to speak to God. Father, we thank you that we can call you Father. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of dads. 
lesson of dads, to instruct us, to guide us, to help us, to provide money for the family alongside our, our, their, their wives. Lord, we thank you for the blessing you give us through fathers. And we pray, Father, you may help us ever to appreciate what they do and the hard work they do on our behalf. So may we be grateful, children, Lord, and thankful, as we as Christians are called to be grateful to you for all the goodness that you give us, Father. Bless us, we pray, and help us to be a blessing to our dads, our fathers, on this Father day, Father's Day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, boys. We're now going to sing, if you can sing with your mouths full of licorice all sorts, we're going to sing, My Jesus, My Saviour, and in every day that dawns.
Jesus, we know that there's no good harbors out there. That some of us may have had experience harm from a father. We know the experience for love and protection we should have experienced, perhaps for some of us. Father's Day is a reminder, but we didn't have a father like other people enjoy a father. But all of us can have our heavenly father. And he is perfect. All his ways are just. All his ways are true. And if you are struggling with an idea of fatherhood today, we just rest in his arms. Because he's different. He defines love. He is the model father. We need to look to him and see the way he reveals himself in the Bible and have the confidence to be embraced and held by him. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for this day. And we thank you, Lord, for a chance to remember you as our Father God. The Lord Jesus, you taught us to pray in that intimate way. And we come before God in our prayers to pray to him as a father. Because when we say the word father, we have an expectation of love. An expectation of love that's not characterized by liking, but characterized by responsibility, by duty of care, by agape, self-giving love. Father, as we come before you today, we thank you that your love is so much greater than human love. It's it's unending. It is perfect. It is beautiful. And it always wants the very best for us, your children. And Father, as we come before you today, we want to pray for those around the world who are not experiencing love and who are experiencing, quite frankly, terror right now. And we do remember the people in the Ukraine. And we pray you will enter that war. We pray, Father, there may be an end to this whole escapade of invasion and of annexation and that Father Russia may retreat back to its borders and those borders may be repaired and that you may bless the people of Russia and the people of Ukraine with peace by bringing about a real and lasting settlement. Lord, end the war in Ukraine. End the suffering. And we think, Father, of those in other parts, we mentioned Nottingham earlier on in the notices, and we pray Lord, for the people of Nottingham. Three people dead and three people seriously injured in some randomness act of violence. But we don't understand what produces this. It seems to be whether it says more and more, or whether we just hear about it more because of our news services, I'm not sure. But Lord, we pray may bring an end to this kind of madness in this world. We long, Lord Jesus, for you to return and bring peace. And we pray you may give peace to those who have lost loved ones in Nottingham and healing to those who are struggling with injuries that they've received. Be in that situation, we pray. Be in that situation. And be with those within our own fellowship that need our love and our prayers. Remember, Val, Father, we pray you may continue to keep your hand upon her. We pray for Abby. We pray for Nigel and Janet. We pray for Beth. For Mel, for Monita. We pray, Father, for Andrew and for Freddie. And we pray, Lord, that you may bring healing into all these situations. Your hand and your peace, your presence and your healing may be present, Father. We pray for ourselves, Father, as we look at Elijah again today, this morning, and look at whole idea of the faithful servant, that you may help each one of us to follow you faithfully. Lord, help us to be children who respect their father, children who obey their father, children who love their father, and that love may not be seen merely in words, but in actions. Help us, Lord, to be the followers that you want us to be, that we may bring light as you bring light. We may bring love as you bring love. We may bring sanity as you bring sanity. And that our lives will bring about your peace and your purposes in this world and place where you've put us. So be of us now, we pray, by your Holy Spirit. Fill each one of us. Use us to your glory, we ask. In Jesus' name, who taught us all to say, Our Father.
who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. If we're coming to our offertory here, do you wish for children will be leaving for their classes? It's all I have and all I am is yours. <coughs> Far too, I've decided it's far too 
high to climb in one simple sermon because I had so much material, about twice as much as I normally would, and I thought we, we, we just need to separate it. So we're looking at Mount Carmel part one. This is the first part of the battle, but it's a very important preamble to what happens on the slopes on Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. So here we are, we're climbing those slopes um, in 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 to 21. 1 Kings 18, 1 to 21. After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, his palace administrator. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel was cleaning off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in another. As Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognised him, bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord Elijah? Yes. He replied, go and tell your master, Elijah is here. What have I done wrong? Asked Obadiah, that you are handing your servant over to Ohab, Ohab, over to Ahab to be put to death. As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And wherever a nation or kingdom claimed you are not there, he made them swear that they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. If I go until Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, fifty in each supplied them with food and water. Now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Elijah said, As the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him that Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the vows. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. May God bless to us that reading of his holy word. slides, please. I'm happy to turn it until we get the situation fixed. I've got those screens in the back, so if I'm looking away from you, I'm not being rude, you haven't offended me, I'm just trying to see what's on the board. That's great. So we're looking then at that, over the next two sessions at the battle for the gods. Who is the true God? The battle that takes place on Mount Carmel. Today we're looking at 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 1 to 21, and next time we'll be looking at chapter 18, verse 16, all the way through to verse 42. Now, a big city lawyer went duck, duck hunting in North America, and he shot and dropped a bird, but it fell in a farmer's field over a fence. So the lawyer began to climb over the fence to get hold of the duck, which you could see about uh, about 700 yards away. And as he was in the middle of mid-climb on the fence, 
Suddenly, an old farmer trundled up an old tractor, and the tractor stopped just next to where the, the, the lawyer was, and big climb. The farmer looked at the lawyer, and the lawyer looked at the farmer, and the farmer said, what are you doing climbing on my fence? Well, the lawyer said, well, I'm duck hunting. I've just shot a duck, and it's landed on your land, and I'm just going there over there to collect it. The farmer replied, this is my property. You're not coming over here. The legal lawyer said, listen, I'm one of the best trial lawyers in Canada, lawyers in Canada. If you don't let me get my duck, I will sue you for every penny that you have. The old father stood there and said, well, apparently you don't know we settle the way we settle disputes in this part of Alberta. You see, over here in Alberta, we believe in the free cook, the free kick rule. The free kick rule, said the lawyer. What's the free kick rule? And the old farmer said, well, it's quite simple, you see. When a dispute, a small dispute occurs, the two parties agree to free kicks each, one after the other. And the person that gives up first, who gives in first, is the person that loses the battle. So the lawyer looked at his old farmer and said, well, I can take you no problem at all. He said, yeah, I agree, I agree with the free kick rule. And the farmer said, that's fine. He said, well, it's my land you're on. He says, therefore, I get to have the first free kicks. And so having got off the tractor, he walked across to the lawyer and using his small but very firm farmer's steel tuck boots, kicked the lawyer right in the shin. And the lawyer began to hop around his left leg, nursing his right leg, and then with his second <coughs> kick, he kicked him in the other shin, at which place he dropped the farmer on all fours, and he was standing there squeaking in pain, and he moved behind the farmer and kicked him up the bottom and kicked him across the field right into a fresh cow pan. Well, the lawyer picked himself up very, very slowly, wiped the freshly made cow poop from his face with the sleeve of his jacket, and then growled <coughs> quietly, right, now it's my turn. And the old farmer smiled and said, now nah, I give up, you can have a duck. <laughs> <laughs> the contest, the contest. <coughs> Here we are having Elijah, Meeting with Ahab, need to set up a meeting with Ahab so he can begin this very, very important contest. There's a very good reason why the contest takes place before the rain falls on the land, and that's because if the rain had just come, as God had promised it would come, people, by being, the way people are, people would simply say, Oh, Baal's finally woken up. He's finally raining upon the land. Baal had lost credibility during the drought. God had to make sure that people realized the reason rain was coming was not by chance, was not by accident, was not serendipity, but was because of a sovereign God who was in control. And that God was not Baal. This is a whole contest between true and false religion. And it's a real message as I've been reading it in the week, I've been really challenged by it, and I've really recognised just how relevant it is to us as Christians in the 21st century. It's so relevant to us, right where we are now. You see, because we are so believing in being inclusive that we muddy the boundaries, we paper over cracks, and pretend everything's okay, everything is the same. And it's not. If you've got problem in the foundations of your house and you simply paper over the cracks, you're inviting disaster later on when those cracks get bigger but you can't see them getting bigger. Until eventually the whole integrity of the house is in danger and the house could collapse on top of you. People often say nowadays, as all roads lead to Rome, so all religions lead to God. You've probably heard people saying that. All religions lead to God. It's a common line now. Well, I, I lived in, 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 in other parts of Europe for eight years of my life, eight years in Germany, different parts of Germany. And I've traveled many roads in Europe, many, many times. And I can tell you, in all the time I've lived in, uh, across other parts of Europe, and all the times I've been driving or riding my motorbike, I've never come to Rome. And I've ridden for many, many thousands of miles. I've never come to Rome. I've been to Rome once in my life, and I went there and flew. 
All roads do not lead into Rome. It, this is a, a naive and foolish statement that people often make. And all religions do not lead to God. And the Battle of Mount Carmel is very Mount Carmel. It's very, very much about that. And it begins, we're told, that after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the land. And we're told this happens in the third year. Now that could be two and a half years. That's the third year. You know, if you're, if you're 20, you are now in your, um, if you're 20, you're now in, in, in your 21st year, if you like. This is a year, it could be the second year, but it's the, it's the third year, but it's in the middle of the second year. But we have two other verses in the Bible, one from Jesus in Luke chapter 4, and one from James that confirm this is in fact not two years, but three and a half years. Uh, James writes in James 5, 17, Elijah prayed earnestly, but it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Three and a half years is a long time. A long time of no rain, no dew, no moisture. People were dying, there was famine in the land. It was in a very bad place. It was in a very bad place for most people. But as so often in our world, there are people that insulate themselves from bad places by wealth. And one of these people was King Ahab. Because while most people were searching for food for themselves and for their families, what is Ahab doing? He's seeking fodder for his animals. And we read in this in verse 5 and 6, we're told Ahab had said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land, they worked to cover. Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in another. People were starving and Ahab's responsibility as king was to care for his people. The whole picture of kings and leadership in the, um, in, the, in the Bible is about caring. The whole pastoral image is about caring. That's why David, King David, wrote that wonderful psalm that talks about the Lord being his shepherd. And David was to be a minor shepherd, an under-shepherd to his people. And here is Ahab, not caring a little about the situation of his family, of, of his people, but merely trying to keep his animals alive. And there was good reason for that, because Animals determined your status. The number of horses you kept in the wild stables determined your status. It's a bit like the difference between having a beaten up old Fiesta and a beautiful brand spanking new Rolls Royce. You know, you look in someone's garage, you can say, that person's got a good wage because you can see there's a nice set of wheels in that garage. It was about status. And for Ahab, the number of horses he had the number of horses, the number of chariots he would have, and we'll hear about this next time, it gave him status. And mules were your transportation, your logistic chain. They carried the goods around. No army could march without mules carrying all your, your, your um, bits and pieces. You needed to set up camp. The soldiers couldn't carry it. It was placed upon mules. So this was a way of resourcing his army, keeping his status as king and as a good king in terms of other nations. Nothing gets the rich mover faster than when their status is threatened. And here the status of Ahab is threatened and is trying to protect that status. And so you have this wonderful contrast, that wonderful line. So we divide up a line. Ahab going in one direction, and Obadiah going in another. And that's spiritually true of them. Ahab was going down this road. Obadiah was going down this road. And so we come to this wonderful, faithful servant called Obadiah. And Obadiah, we're told in verse 3, was Ahab's palace administrator. And it's clear that he was a, an administrator, a trusted servant within the royal household, because here we have um, Ahab des describing his most critical possessions, his horses and his mules. And asking Ahab to get involved, and Obadiah to get involved in providing good, clean fodder for them to keep them alive. And that's when we come across this wonderful thing the divine encounter. The divine encounter. And so it was during this servant's search for good fodder 
but he chances upon the prophet Elijah. Then we're told, as Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met with him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed down to the ground and said, Is this really you, my Lord Elijah? Yes, he replied. Now I say chances because that's often the way we think about it, isn't it? Obadiah is there looking for land that he can feed you know, Ahab's mules and Ahab's horses on, and he chances upon Elijah. And that's because we live in a world that we talk about such things as chance and luck. Do you know that's not the vocabulary of the Bible at all? And it's not the vocabulary in this passage. We're told, as Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. This wasn't by chance, this was by plan. God purposed it this way. And it's quite a miracle because this whole area was vast. Ahab has said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. He didn't say, go to this little spot here or this little spot there. They divided the northern kingdom into two sections, Ahab looking after one, Obadiah looking after the other. It was a vast area and there were no satellites, no satellite phones to track, no GPS, no drones to look for people, no helicopters. It was literally like looking for a needle in a haystack. But Elijah met him. Because that was the plan of God. You know, we must never forget that if we have a huge area to cover, a huge problem, we have an even bigger God. Elijah met him. There's no, debunk, there's no chances in the divine plan. You're not here by chance. You know, that's what the world tells us. They say that you're part of an evolutionary plan, a random, we live in a random universe. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says God has a plan and you're part of it. But each one of you here is special. You're not random. You're not merely an animal, part of the big animal world. You are chosen by God. God has a plan for each one of our lives. The Bible tells us this time and time again. Look at scripture, Ephesians 1 verse 1. We're told, Paul says, in him we are, all, we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God has a plan. He's working through his plan right now. I know that you can do all things. The purpose of yours can be thwarted, writes Job. Job, in the midst of his suffering and his problems, recognises that God has a plan. Jeremiah says in Lamentations, who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? God has a plan. And God's plan was he wanted his man, his, his servant, um, uh, his prophet, Elijah, to meet with the king. And the person to affect that meeting was another servant called Obadiah. God has a plan. That's wonderful. Because that means every day of your life, when you go out and you submit your day to the Lord, you can ask God to give you another person to meet that day. God's not a random God. We don't live in a random universe. God has a plan. And you can ask God to give you opportunities to meet people, perhaps to give them a blessing, perhaps even to pray for them. Sometimes I meet people I pray for, I don't even know I'm praying for them. When I was uh, in, 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 in the military and on operations, one of the things I used to do to, to um, ex expand my contact with the, with the soldiers was to do haircuts. I've, I've cut thousands and thousands of soldiers' hair. I made a, a, a chance, a, a dollar a, ha a, a haircut in, um, in Iraq in 2003, and I made for over $2,000 for charity, that I gave to a charity at the end of the tour. So I, I, and I did many haircuts and actually charged for it. I knew on one, on one tour alone, did over 2,000 haircuts. And when I used to be doing a haircut for a paratrooper, I'd be praying for them whilst I was cutting their hair and talking to them and seeing how they were. I didn't realize that part of it was laying hands on them, but that's what I was doing. <laughs> laying hands and removing their hair. You've got every opportunity, if you just ask God in his great plans, to make you have contact with people and to treat that as a contact and to say that little, little, little arrow prayer, Father, what can I say? 
How can you use me in this connection with this person in this place at this time? God does not have a random universe. Elijah met with um, Obadiah because God had put the two of them together. That was his purpose and that was his will. But then we have, not only with the divine encounter, we have this definite reaction. When you read this passage, it seems quite strange initially, doesn't it, that Obadiah is not too impressed when Elijah says, I want to meet with King Ahab. And it can be very easy for us to react and think, oh man, what a, what a coward. What a coward. You know, here's Elijah. What a coward for him not actually wanting to meet with Ahab. But the thing was, is that Obadiah knew Ahab. Obadiah probably knew Ahab better than, than did Elijah. Because Obadiah worked in the royal ha household. He knew Ahab. He knew Jezebel. He's seen firsthand how evil and how malicious and how wicked they could be. And he was really worried that this, this meeting, if Elijah didn't turn up, would end up in his death. And he cries, what have I done? What have I done wrong? But you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death. And then he tells him that, that basically that Ahab has been hunting over high and low over all the lands, making other kingdoms and other kings swear that Elijah wasn't there. He was trying to make sure that Elijah understood that while he'd been away, he'd become the public enemy number one. He'd become Israel's most wanted. He'd become the person that everyone was hunting for. Elijah, the prophet of God. And Obadiah feared that if Elijah um, did what he often did, was spurred away by God somewhere and didn't turn up at the meeting, that suddenly Obadiah would be held accountable for the absence of the prophet. He was worried. Because Obadiah, you see, was a double agent. He was a faithful to the king as much as he could be in all matters in regard to the royal household, as far as he could be, but he was supremely faithful to his God. His heart was firmly in the Yahweh camp. In fact, when you look at the name Obadiah, Obadiah is quite an interesting name because Obed is the word, Hebrew word for slave or servant, and Obadiah literally means servant of Yah. Servant of Yahweh. You've got Elijah, whose name means, um, Elijah means God is Yahweh. And you've got Obadiah, whose name means servant of Yah. Servant of Yahweh. He was there working at the king's table, but he was working for the king of kings. Working for God himself. And they've proven that he was to be trusted because he'd actually saved in his time over a hundred prophets and secreted them around in two caves in the area of Carmel, Mount Carmel. They were all heading in one direction, folks were climbing that mountain. And as they climbed that mountain, Ahab didn't realize that around in those caves, in that mountainside, were a hundred prophets of Yahweh, hidden away in the tunnels. You know, it's um, uh, Mount Carmel is an incredible area. It's actually got over 2,000 caves in its limestone ridges. Over 2,000. It'd be very easy to hide 100 prophets. They could move around which caves if they wanted to without being found. It's a wonderful, porous, rabbit warren of an area. You could very easily hide 100, if not more than 100, prophets and keep them safe. Obadiah was a faithful servant. He was working for the purposes of God because he realized that God had chosen him as he got promoted up, and the, up the chain of command in the, in the Israel government. God, he realized that God was using him and placed him in that place as so often happens when you read the Old Testament stories and New Testament stories. People are put in places because God puts them there. God is in control. God is in charge. There he is, where God wants him to be. And so Elijah says, yeah, I'll be there. He says, as the Lord Almighty lives. Oh, sorry. So, um, I forgot to mention this. Um, this. This is quite wonderful. The 
words that is used for supply, the verb the supplied, it's used when it says that, that um, uh, Obadiah supplied the, um, uh, the prophets with food and water, is the same word that's used in the Hebrew language when it's talked about the ravens feeding, uh, uh, feeding Elijah and the widow feeding Elijah. In other words, a, um, Obadiah was the ravens or the widow that was feeding the hundred prophets. God was working through him in the same way that God had fed Elijah with the ravens and with the widow. And it's very interesting when you look at Elijah, Elijah says, as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. But Ahab didn't realise it, but Ahab was standing before two prophets of Yahweh, two prophets, two servants of Yahweh, two faithful servants, Elijah and Obadiah. And both were courageous. Elijah confronts the evil king face to face. He's an in your face kind of guy. He stands there and looks right at Ahab's nostrils and tell him, tells him the words of God. Whereas Obadiah is working behind the scenes, working as an administrator within the royal household, but secretly taking away a hundred prophets, even under the right royal snooty nose of Jezebel, to hide them in the caves of Carmel. Both put their lives, lives on the line. Both face imprisonment, if not death, if they're caught. Elijah is loud. And Obadiah works behind the scenes. You see, there's no single blueprint for being a servant of God. Don't think that being a servant of God and being a faithful servant of God is about being behind the pulpit. Or is about being a prophet. Or is about being an evangelist. Or being a missionary. All of us can serve God, both in front of the scenes and behind the scenes. The key is to be faithful and to listen to God and to put him first. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in every one, it is the same God at work. The faithful servants of God, Obadiah and Elijah, you and me here in Witten Baptist Church. And so God arranges this meeting, and Obadiah arranges the meeting with Ahab, and they meet then with the faithless servant. You see, every one of the kings of Israel, every one of the kings of Judah, was there to serve God. <coughs> you see, if those who've watched the coronation would realize that the coronation service is based upon coronation of King Solomon in front of Zadok the priest. In fact, some of the music we play is called Zadok the priest. And you see in that one of the emblems given to the king um, were emblems displayed and pointing out that the king is meant to be the servant of the nation. That's the way it is within the monarchy. It's based upon the Old Testament monarchy. And Ahab was meant to be a servant of the people. But Ahab was very happy to be served didn't quite like the other responsibility. He seems to barely acknowledge that particular role of him being king. When you look at him and Obadiah, you see two very different types of servants. You look at Obadiah and Ahab. Ahab, Obadiah was concerned with the lives of the people. And Ahab was concerned with the lives of the animals. Obadiah saved 100 prophets of Yahweh Ahab allowed Jezebel to kill hundreds of the prophets of Yahweh. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord, verse 3. Ahab proclaimed and promoted Baal, 1 Kings 16. Obadiah feared the Lord. Ahab feared his wife. Very, very different people. What does he say to Elijah when he meets him? Is he happy? Does he greet him as a long lost friend? No, he says then this. He says, you're the one responsible for all my problems. He says, is that you, you troubler of Israel? How typical is this of people? That their lives are in pieces because of decisions they've made and the roads they've taken and when the push comes to sharp, it's God who's to blame. It's God who's responsible for my mess. God. Is that you, you troubler 
of Israel, says Ahab to God's holy prophet. And Elijah's having none of it. He says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. You see, trouble can very often be the consequence of sin and disobedience. <coughs> sin was the bringer of trouble to Israel. And it's because Ahab had chosen to go away, away from God trouble was falling upon him and the people in the form of this drought. You know, the Bible is quite clear that one of the best types of wisdom you can have is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. So simple. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, says the Psalm 110. All who follow his precepts have great understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, says Proverbs 9, verse 10. I'm a great lover of maps. I love maps. I consider from, from way uh, in, uh, climbing mountains or going for walks, I can spend hours having a cup of coffee and my breakfast reading the map. You, I love to read maps. They, they're like books. You can look at them and you can read, try and work out the territory, how you're going to go. I love looking at maps. I love exploring maps. But the key to unlocking a map is a compass. And a compass tells you where north is, where south is, where east is, where west is. So you can orientate yourself on that map and orientate yourself in the ground by using that map and that compass. You can, only, you can turn the map with the compass to work out the way you're looking to make sure you can interpret the ground according to the map. But you're looking the right way. It has to be the compass. And the fear of the Lord is a compass that everyone needs. It points us in the right direction. Because without going in the right direction, we're going to have serious problems in our lives. The fear of the Lord is that compass that points us towards God and has, gives us the right reaction to have towards God. To fear and respect Him. One of the things we used to do with soldiers is to try and teach them the fear of their rifle. It's not because we want to be terrified of their weapon. We want to understand that the weapon was a fearful thing. It could do damage to people. It could do damage to them. One of the great tragedies of my first tour in Iraq was the Paratroop Regiment, which we lost the youngest soldier in the serving the British Army because he had an accident with his rifle, because he didn't treat it with the fear and respect it deserved. Fear is important. And the fear of God is not to be terrified of God, but it's to respect God, it's to respect his word, not to treat his word lightly, because he is God. The fear of the Lord is to begin the wisdom and it's because Elijah fears God and because Elijah loves his people and wants them to receive the blessing of God, when they get on Mount um, Carmel, the first thing he makes to them is this. The final thing in this sermon, the frank statement. He makes a frank statement. You see, he instructs the king Ahab to go throughout all, you, all Israel and to assemble all the leaders of the tribes and all the leaders of the people. It says all of Israel, but you wouldn't get all of Israel on Mount Carmel. They say to go out and get all the significant people, all the tribal leaders, all those in charge of the big families, to come and meet him together on Mount Carmel to represent the people. When we're told this, when he gets them all together on Mount Carmel, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal is God, follow him. He's saying to them quite simply, make your mind up. Stop sitting on the fence. Make your mind up. You see, you can't go in both directions at the same time. He says, how long? Sorry, I'm going to put it on my notes. It's how long will you waver between two different opinions? When we read that passage, it's really quite full of drama and full of movement. And when I first read it, I was quite shaken by the end of it because it's a while since I looked at this passage in detail. Because Elijah, uh, uh, the Bible then says this. It says, Elijah said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if the people is God, follow the him. But the people said nothing. Because the people could say nothing because they realized what Elijah was saying was true and that they were conflicted. They 
they realised that they were trying to serve God, the living God, and trying to serve Baal at the same time. It's impossible to go in two different directions at once. That's the nonsense of all religions being the same. If you study Islam, you'll find that Jesus is a minor prophet. He comes under the prophet Jonah. He's number seven in the list. He's not a great prophet. He's certainly not the son of God. No Muslim would ever agree to Jesus being the son of God. If you drive past Birmingham, you your way to find in Rome, if you drive past Birmingham, uh, uh, up in the Midlands, you can drive past the biggest mosque in Europe, the central mosque in Birmingham. On the side of the minaret, it says, the Quran, the last testament. You have the Old Testament for the Jews, the New Testament for the Christians, the last testament for the Muslims. And their claim, because their evolution, they're thinking, their claim is the last is always the best. But Muhammad, because he came 600 years after Jesus, is more important than Jesus Christ. Jesus is not Lord. Allah is God. Muhammad is his prophet. In no way in the, in the, in the Islamic faith is Jesus Christ the Son of God. Is he Christ, the anointed one? These two positions are diametrically opposed. They cannot be blended into some sick soup that you can drink together and think, oh, all religions are leading the same direction. They don't. Buddhism doesn't even have a god. It has a monk called Buddha. The idea of salvation is to become one with the Atman, the eternal being, the eternal spirit, all the airy fairy pink unicorns you can think of. You become one with them all. There's no sin in Buddhism. It's all about karma, becoming one with the universe. And it's a horrendous idea. I don't want to be blended and become part of every other bit of matter in the universe, because that's what Buddhism offers you. There's no eternal life. You just kind of blend in to everything else and become part of the eternal universe. And Hinduism, Hinduism is full of all different types of gods. It's one of the most primitive religions out there, one of the oldest of religions, very similar to the Canaanite religions and the, the Greek religions and the Roman religions. There's all many different gods doing different things in different shapes and sizes. There's nothing about Jesus Christ in Hinduism. These religions are so different. They cannot be one. And Elijah says, make your mind up. You can't follow two gods going two different directions at once. It's impossible. Make your mind up. And the people said nothing. You see, true religion requires true action. And you see that in the life of Elijah. You see that in the life of Obadiah, who put all on the line in order to serve the living God. Their lives, all they had or owned, was on the line in the service of the living God. True belief requires true action. And I just says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Jesus says something very similar in the in New Testament. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And you can't serve both Baal and Yahweh. You can't serve both your careers and the living God. You can't serve yourself and God. You've got to make a decision. Who is God? Who is in charge? Not about your words. You can say anything you like. And many people will get to heaven and say, Lord, Lord, and I'll do this in your name and that in your name and the others. And Jesus will say, away from me because I never knew you. It's not about pretense. You've got lots of lovely people in lovely churches looking very lovely on Sunday in their Sunday best. It's not about what's going on outside, it's what's going on in the inside. What the Spirit of God sees. What God sees. And when we waver between two opinions like the people of Israel were doing, we just immobilize ourselves. That word there in the Hebrew language, the word waver, it literally means several things. It means hobbling. Waver's quite weak. It's not very descriptive. It means hobbling or limping. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's suggesting that the person is actually using two bits of wood as crutches. It's speaking of someone who's hobbled by their beliefs because they cannot go anywhere effectively because their 
they're modelled. They're modelled. Because they're trying to serve God and trying to serve Baal at the same time. That's what syncretism is. And we live in a society where many theologians try and say the best way forward is to be nice to everyone and is to be syncretistic, uh, bringing all these other beliefs together. You know, there's nothing new. Someone that says nothing new under the sun. That's exactly what the Romans did. That's exactly what the Romans did. And the reason the Christians were persecuted in Rome was because they refused to worship the emperor. The Roman policy was you can worship any god you like as long as you also worship the emperor. You can worship Christianity, you can worship this man Jesus, we're not bothered, but worship the emperor as well. And as long as you did that, you could do it. And all the meat in the, in the, in the, uh, in the markets would be offered to Caesar, the various Caesars, what have you, and there were always debates about whether you should eat meat off the island and all the rest of it. It was massive discussion, but the Romans weren't bothered. They tried to unite everyone to be blend them all together under the imperial cult of worshiping Caesar. But the Christians were told no. You only worship one God, because there is only one God. Caesar was never God. <coughs> if Caesar was God, he'd still be alive now. All the Caesars that resisted, including the evil man Caligula, are dead and buried. They're rotten. They're turned to dust. We will see them one day again when they stand before the throne of God. They are in no way, because they were never gods. There's only one God, and that's Jesus Christ. William Sanford writes, such syncretism is always considered to be broad-minded whereas the other is narrow-minded. You will be called narrow-minded if you just follow Jesus Christ. But the problem, problem is, you can't be right and wrong at the same time. Either Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, or he's not the way, the truth, and the life. If he's not the way, then he's a dead end. He's the, if he's not the truth, he's a lie. <coughs> if he's not life, he's death. So then why follow him? You'll be called narrow-minded. Like, a, uh, like Elijah, who needed times to go away to, into a quiet place to rest, to get rid of all that noise that's going on in your head. There's only one God. As Elijah climbs to Mount Carmel, we're looking at that next week, we'll see, not next week, week after next, we'll see just how powerful and great that God is. The problem with sin is it entangles us. The writer of the Hebrew says, let us throw off every sin that hinders and every sin that easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. If you try and follow the living God with other gods of this world, you will be crippled, you will not get anywhere, you will not be able to run. Sin, that sin will tangle your feet up. You will limp your way through life like the picture we saw earlier on. Elijah says quite simply, it's binary. We hate binary nowadays. The Bible doesn't. The Bible says quite simply, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Elijah saying, follow the truth. And we'll find out, find out on Mount Carmel in a couple of weeks' time just who is true. People were called to be faithful servants. And being a faithful servant of Yahweh is not always easy. At periods in Elijah, it may be easy. It would have been easy at times if, if Elijah hadn't been born at the time when Ahab came along, who was evil king that existed in the, in the Old Testament. But God used Ahab because, sorry, God used Elijah because he was Elijah. He was the right prophet to face the evil man Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And if God has brought you into this world for this time, it's because you are the right people for this time. The right Christians, if only you're faithful, you put the Lord first and make sure you give your day to the Lord. Lord, who do I meet today that you put in my path to meet? You put your jobs, your lives, your holidays, all the decisions you make before the Lord and say, Lord, guide me in this. Guide me in the purchase of my next house. Guide me in the purchase of my next vehicle. Guide me in my relationships. Guide me. You are first. I serve you first. Obadiah was such a faithful servant. Elijah was such a faithful servant because their words and their actions match. Let's make sure that we don't follow flawed leaders like Ahab, but follow people like Elijah and like Obadiah to ensure that we work for the purposes of God, both in front and behind the scenes, to bring him glory. You can 
only be a follower when you're walking behind. You can't be a follower in front. Never get in front of God. Ask him to lead you in all the ways of your life. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be faithful followers of you. Lord, we do. Lord, you know we're frustrated sometimes because we all have personalities, we've got strengths and weaknesses, and sometimes our weaknesses get in our way. Sometimes our weaknesses take away our confidence. Sometimes our weaknesses, Lord, mean that we struggle to go in your way. Lord, we pray as you gave Elijah and you gave Obadiah the strength to be faithful. Enable us to be faithful through too. Help us, Lord, to be true followers of the living God. Help our actions to match our words. Help us, Lord, to make a decision, just like Joshua made the decision, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May we, each one of you, each one of us, serve you, Lord, to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together that lovely song by Phil Wickham, The Battle Belongs.
us now. Give us a good week, Father. And give us divine encounters with people that you want us to meet, that you want us to pray for, that you want us to share our lives with. Lord, use us to help us, each one, to be a faithful servant of the living God.